Good evening. This is Goldie. It's Wednesday, July 21st, 2010. I'm transmitting from a secure location again in the finest custom sealed plexiglass extreme pong room in the world. Please become a follower of mine on Ustream. Please note that I will be doing the next few shows from this secure location and will not be able to be sending email alerts, only Facebook alerts. But they will be happening at 6 o'clock central on each Wednesday. By the way, I have someone monitoring, surveilling the chat for any good questions you might have. I want to start by going back to last week's economic collapse rant with a July 16th article in the New York Times, which showed once again the structural defect of the regulatory system to regulate. It's the new financial oversight bill that is Congress' response to the economic collapse. It was signed today, by the way, by uh, Obama. Very simply, auto dealers are exempted from the lending regulations and provisions of the Act. The ugliest, ugliest part about this is that we, the taxpayers, actually own the companies that lobbied for this exemption. Here's a classic example of Goldie ranting for weeks about regulatory failures and the need for a constitutional amendment to cut off our legal graft system of government awards of portions of our air, land, water, and taxpayer money, defined as the commons. And then there is this turned around and convoluted taxpayer financed lobbying effort to reduce protections for taxpayers in the form of car, car buyers that borrow money through the dealerships. Seems pretty odd to me and an example of the necessity of constitutional amendments to fix this structural defect. Are there any questions from the studio audience? Doesn't seem like it. All right. Going back to BP, which I've done many, many times, I hypothesized what a disaster similar to BP's fail-safe failures would look like in the form of a nuclear accident and found that it was too horrific to contemplate. A few days ago, the New York Times talked about the Obama administration's attempts to cajole the Sorry about that. To cajole the nuclear industry into building more nuclear power plants. Do not call him the environmental president. The problem that occurs with assessing, assessing risk in this industry is that we have not had a lot of disasters. But I can say without flinching that an accident at the Indian River plant upstream of New York City would be devastating. In Gary Hardin's 1993 book, Living Within Limits, he showed that no detailed risk analysis was even done for the 60 reactors in this country built prior to the Rasmussen report in 1975. It turns out that we have to assume that we can have a stable government, social system, and cadre of nuclear priests willing to watch over the spent fuel for 100,000 years while it degrades to a safe level. We have to protect our groundwater, air, and land for 100,000 years. I'm not even going to begin to talk about an actual accident or plan. I'm just talking about the spent fuel. We all agree that the government is incompetent. And have seen that when industry lobbies, they get the regulations that they propose. How safe is the repository in Andrews, Texas? How safe is the groundwater underneath that repository? Earthquakes have started happening south of Fort Worth in an area previously earthquake free. Is Andrews going to stay earthquake free for 100,000 years? 100,000? We see from today's news that the BP cap is holding. However, there are five leaks in the surrounding ocean floor, meaning that the well itself may be damaged and irreparable. We've been assured by the admiral in charge that the leaks are from one of the 27,000 sealed wells in the Gulf of Mexico. 27,000 sealed wells. If that's true, then the only reason we saw these leaks is because we were looking for them right now. But there's no regulatory system of reinspecting the plugged wells out there. How dare we think that nuclear power will be safe for 100,000 years? It's not nuclear power, it's the nuclear waste. 100,000. Assurances from Fox News entertainers 
will not do it. Let me do a little talk about message, <clears throat> which I always do. July 19th, 2010, Fox has a new message phrase, which I had not heard before. It's kind of interesting. Drug and human smuggling. This was followed by a big story on the feds versus Arizona lawsuit. That phrase that they used, which is drug and human smuggling, it's so far away from illegal immigration or illegal immigration problem that it's just ridiculous and it's inflammatory. Now, as usual, maybe they're just selling advertising minutes, but my God, how do we have a reasoned discussion if all the words used are inflammatory? Don't come around my house with that crap, please. Sorry, I digressed. In my immigration rant number one, I put forth the concept that our country and our limited freedoms that come with it should never allow any police officer or other government actor to differentiate or single someone out. Profile is the defined term. Because of their color, religion, sexual orientation, etc. I also pointed out that survey questions that ask, do you support the Arizona immigration law, 70% 70, 70 said yes, by the way, should not be asked to people who could not be racially profiled, whites, as they have no fear or concept of the feeling of being singled out because of your color. We have a constitution, and apparently, some civil liberties and protections. Let me tell you what it's like in Costa Rica. The cops can pull anyone over without there being a crime committed, or even the suspicion of a crime committed, or you can be, sorry, or you can be detained while walking on the street and searched. Me being white, when this happened in a bar last time I was in Costa Rica, they bypassed me and only searched people who were brown or white and scraggly not white tourists and legitimate looking expats. I was disgusted, but also fearful, as it's allowed. Just think about that. Where are your papers? This is what I talked about in the immigration rant. Why would we ever dream of wanting a system like that with roadblocks and indiscriminate searches? I mean, that's like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia all over again. A good friend who lives in Costa Rica actually said that the cops profile rental cars and ask, if you can help me out, I can help you out. Actually a form of economic racial profiling. But those are only the traffic cops. There are immigration cops, building permit cops, and then there are the local cops. We realize that they differentiate the enforcement here. So everyone, everyone can have their own little fiefdom from which they extract their extortion dollars or as I call it, their own little piece of the commons. Commons being expanded to include these private takings of extortion money. There's been a lot of talk lately about how Obama's policies are creating uncertainty and that his new higher taxes, currently none are proposed by the way, are causing businesses to hold off hiring employees. Well, let's talk about how it is in a second world country or a US protectorate, Costa Rica. I was speaking with a waterfront bar owner yesterday and she told me that the rates she pays for water bear no relationship to the amount of water that she uses. The system of building permits also is largely corrupt, with officials expecting a mordida or a bite, which is a mandatory bribe to supplement their incomes. The amount of the bribe is not set, obviously, so in a building project you cannot anticipate the cost of the permits or the cost of any red tag removals or removals of stop work orders. I've said in my prior regulatory BP rants that we want businesses to maximize their profits under the law and that businesses need a consistent regulatory legal framework under which to accumulate these profits. So when you look at the U.S. versus Costa Rica with Republicans spouting a potential increase in marginal tax rates in the U.S., you can see that the alarm being raised about uncertainty in the U.S. as to its policies is dwarfed by the inconsistencies apparent in what is a pretty good second world country. Just look at their socialized health care system. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Religious intolerance shows your ignorance. I said last week that there seems to be a huge anti-mosque movement going on in this country, in the US, and Fox is at the forefront. I received an email on July 15, 2010 from the American Center for Law and Justice, the ACLJ, 
from Jay Sekulow, Chief Counsel. He's also a regular guest commentator on Fox. Let me read their mission statement first, then I'll read the communication. The mission statement is, sorry, American Center for Law and Justice is a DBA for Christian Advocates Serving Evangelism, Inc., a tax-exempt, not-for-profit, religious corporation as defined under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, specifically dedicated to the ideal that religious freedom and freedom of speech are inalienable, God-given rights. The Center's purpose is to educate, promulgate, conciliate, and, where necessary, litigate to ensure that those rights are protected under the law. The organization has participated in numerous cases before the Supreme Court, Federal Court of Appeals, Federal District Courts, and various state courts, blah, blah, blah. The gift is very much appre uh, appreciated, fully deductible, as a charitable contribution. Now, let me go ahead and read the communication. And I've seen this guy on Fox. He's a lawyer. Dear John, I don't believe you want to allow a slap in the face of freedom. As I write you, the ACLJ is serving as lead counsel in a critical new case representing New York City firefighter Tim Brown, who survived the 9-11 terrorist attacks and lost nearly 100 friends in the collapse of the Twin Towers. We're aggressively urging New York City officials to landmark the sacred site of a planned Islamic mosque. Whoa, where parts of one of the hijacked planes landed. Parts, check that out, they use where parts of one of the hijacked planes landed. Parts being, of course, we know body parts. And to preserve the memory of 9-11 and its victims. Generously support the ACLJ as we serve as lead counsel in this critical new case. See the impact of your gift doubled through the $450,000 Fight for Freedom Matching Challenge as you stand with those who do not want an Islamic mosque built at ground zero. It is not only offensive to those who lost loved ones in the 9-11 attacks to construct an Islamic mosque at this site, but even more disturbing, there are growing questions about the imam behind this project. Questions about his ties to terrorists. That was in bold, by the way. Today, we're not only working to reject this troubling move once and for all in honor of America's 9-11 heroes, but we're also preparing for a legal battle over Arizona's immig immigration law. Our amicus brief in United States versus Arizona is due next week. This attempt to stop Arizona's law by the US Department of Justice is flawed and represents nothing more than a waste of taxpayer funds. Arizona clearly has the constitutional authority to protect and defend its borders. With your solid backing in giving and prayer, we'll continue to support the people of Arizona against this and other legal challenges to their immigration law. Okay. All right, now it says, sorry. It says in that communication, in their mission statement, that they are dedicated to the ideal that religious freedom and freedom of speech are inalienable, inalienable God-given rights. Well, the First Amendment to our Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Sometimes you just need to read it out loud, you know? Maybe louder and slower so more people understand the words. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Why does it seem that a vocal number of God-given Christians want to erode the very fundamental civil rights that could be used against them if another religion came into the majority in this country? Why would you possibly fight against someone building a church anywhere in that city's, where that city's zoning would allow? Using their own funds. If the imam that is one of the leaders of this church has ties to terrorists, why don't you just arrest him? We have laws for that. Why don't you pass a constitutional amendment overriding the restriction on the establishment of a state religion and place Christianity as a state religion, as the founders explicitly denied? 
There are so many things wrong with this whole thing, from the ACLJ to the movement against the mosque. How can it be other, anything other than racism or complete and total ignorance? Look, it's too important of a fundamental right to not allow one group or color or religion to use the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Okay, I think I've arrived at another truth. Every time that you do anything to officially deny a fundamental right to one group or individual or color or religion, you officially deny it to all individuals, groups, colors, and religions. That's going to be a truth I'm putting on the list. Let me talk about surveillance and peripherally the structural regulatory defect issues that I've talked about before. Again, and I'm going to do this again. A July 15, 2010 article in the Texas Observer entitled The Eyes of Texas Cops Are Upon You is another classic case of vendors pushing a technology to the taxpayers via the government and completely violating the fundamental right of privacy at the same time. The scary part for you should be that in talking to most people or governmental officials, there's usually no thought about the actual importance of the right of privacy and the slippery slope of erosion of this fundamental right in the name of crime fighting or terrorism. A slippery slope, by the way, is when a little chip is taken out of something that becomes larger and larger until it's all gone. In this frightening situation, if Texas passes a law allowing these readers, the proponents already tried it in the 2009 session, the vendors of these $17,000 machines will allow the government to know exactly where you are and where, he, where you have been forever. Again, it will allow the government to know exactly where you are and where you've been forever. So as my buddy and I were go, uh, gasping over the invasions of this law, he said, we should just put a chip in everyone at birth, knows where you are at all times, here's all conversations, here's all thoughts, knows every substance placed in your body, and dispatches the police or just kills you for the appropriate violation. Why not? As that's what we're moving towards on this slippery slope. The vendors push the technology to get rich, they lobby and donate to the legislators, and they promise jobs to the purchasing agents in the government after they've gotten out of government. So they say to Texas, buy this product. Using this technology, Britain, by the way, using this technology, Britain reportedly marked the cars of anti-war demonstrators during the Iraq War. My God, is this the kind of society that America touts as they hate our freedom when talking about our enemies and asking why they hate us? We usually say, they hate our freedom. Well, look what it's getting towards. A friend of mine in Dallas, and a longtime fan, sent me a disturbing picture from the Lakewood area of Dallas, Texas, an area of recent McMansions and future teardowns. It's a separate sign under one of the fancy street signs that they have up there in Lakewood, and it reads, this neighborhood is monitored by video surveillance. They should just thank God that I don't live there anymore and saw those signs going up. I was, however, really pleased that my friend asked for advice. I responded that I have a surveillance rant number one up on Ustream that details the questions that need to be answered by the surveilling authority before we allow this type of unconstitutional intrusion into our bedrooms, bathrooms, living rooms, and backyards. As I thought about it and stared at the picture of the surveillance sign, I thought that since we know and the authorities admit at least in the Austin COPS manual detailed in my surveillance rant number one. There, we know that there is no statistically significant deterrent or crime-solving benefit beyond making the citizens feel safer, whatever that means, to having surveillance cameras installed throughout a community. Let me repeat, there is no statistically significant deterrent or crime-solving benefit beyond making the citizens feel safer, whatever that means, to having surveillance cameras installed throughout a community. It's the erosion of privacy 
that is the troubling slippery slope that I've been dealing with. Fox on July 16th, by the way, had a panel discussing credit card fraud over the internet. I love those panels on Fox. As I watched, we heard this great, oh my God, the sky is falling. These chat rooms are dangerous. And then I heard in my brain, we must infiltrate and not worry about the privacy on the internet. Since under the declining expectation of privacy, think Facebook, no one has a right to expect anything to be private on the internet anymore. It's an interesting argument. It must be being pushed by the advertisers. I mean, I'm talking about advertisers on Facebook. Look at the right-hand side of Facebook. There's all kinds of ads over there. I thought, and most people think, that they've turned off all public information except for friends. Well, how do they know to put Austin ads up there f for me? I mean, I understand the declining expectation of privacy because some people even use Facebook as a public diary, which was unheard of 20 years ago. There was no way to do it. You just gossiped. Yesterday, a tech friend of mine related that there is absolutely no expectation of privacy anymore. They know everything. They hear everything. And they see everything. Well, these are not the crazed, paranoid ramblings of Goldie. This guy is legitimate. He has a job and a family. A Washington Post article entitled Top Secret America, A Hidden World, Growing Beyond Control, that was the name of the article, certainly showed that the government is gathering everything at no cost. All conversations on phones, all emails, all web searches, all chats, all Facebook pictures, chats, videos and messages, all Skype calls, all PDFs, all YouTube videos, basically everything is being stored. Everything is being stored. Everything. I then replied that the truth of this statement made it critically important to reserve that area called the home as the last bastion of privacy. Little aside, something I love about Texans is their recognition of this sacred and holy right to keep them people off my property. I received an email from the ACLU on June 29, 2010. Remember the ACLU? The much hated, maligned, misguided, malevolent, evil ACLU? Do you remember them being one of the root causes of the 9-11 events as retribution from God? Do you remember them failing in their mission by defending a woman's right to wear a shroud over her face for the taking of a driver's license photo? I do. And I'd like to actually bring up that last example, which is an actual failing. Not the ACLU haters' excellent message phrases that I said at the beginning. They caused 9-11? Seriously, guys. Anyway, I had to get that out of the way. They do have that failing of the burqa issue in Florida. This email from the ACLU, I, I do need to read it to you. Dear ACLU supporter, the books, music, and movies you browse or buy online can reveal private and profoundly intimate information about your life. It's time to upgrade the Electronic Communications Privacy Act to keep our personal information safe. Can government agencies, sorry. Can government agencies conduct sweeping collections of your most personal and private information, including the books you buy online? That fundamental question is at stake in an ACLU lawsuit we just filed. The ACLU intervened in an ex existing Amazon.com lawsuit to resist the North Carolina Department of Revenue's demand that Amazon turn over thousands of customer records. Customers' records, sorry. The laws governing electronic privacy haven't been updated since 1986. Before the internet as we know it even existed, the books, music, and movies you browse or buy online can reveal private and profoundly intimate information about your life. It's time to upgrade the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Keep our personal information safe. Tell Congress to update our privacy laws and keep your information personal, private, and protected. Now let me read something else on this. Our anonymous clients in the Amazon.com lawsuit include, and just think of yourself when I go through each one of these, Jane Doe number one, who purchased books on self-help and how to get a divorce and a restraining order after her former spouse threatened to kill her. Jane Doe number two, the general counsel of a global corporation who purchased books and movies with overt political leanings, as well as books that may reveal her religious beliefs. Jane Doe number three, 
who purchased books on mental health in order to better understand the conditions afflicting her former spouse, including stop walking on eggshells, taking your life back when someone you care about has borderline personality disorder. Pardon me for a second. Can you turn up that light a little bit, bud? If the North Carolina government gets its way, this information and the personal records of thousands of others will be in government hands. We've gone to court to stop this massive invasion of privacy and free speech rights, but we must stop it from happening in the future. Amazon has refused to yield to the unreasonable demands for detailed information about what specific individuals are buying online. As part of a tax office audit, it has already handed over lists of the exact items purchased and their cost. But North Carolina has refused to relent in its belief that it is also entitled to know the identities of purchasers. It shouldn't take either Amazon standing tall or the ACLU intervening to prevent this kind of abuse. We should have clear laws that safeguard our private records, especially when they involve expressive materials like books. Thank you. Sincerely, Anthony D. Romero. Now, I love what the ACLU does. Prior to a public safety commission meeting regarding the surveillance cameras in East Austin, and that was in surveillance rant number one, I was proud to be called one of those people from the ACLU, even though I was not there in that capacity. However, this communication is the classic example of what the ACLU needs to be doing versus what I need to be doing, which is to inform you of how strongly I feel that while it appears that we cannot do anything to stop this gigantic snowball of governmental intrusion in every aspect of our lives, we need to carve out an area where we can sit around and talk politics or art or music, completely free from whoever we do not want to be there with us. Remember the book and movie 1984? There's a screen in every room of your house where they watch you to make sure you do your exercises correctly. Just put yourself in that mindset for a second that someone's watching over everything you do. Any questions, studio audience? Moving on. Here's a question from a Canadian friend here. Well, second. I, how do you keep my private information safe? But and and at the same time, you're keeping up safe too. You okay. Know, terrorist or whatever. Okay. The question was, how do we keep our private How do we keep our private information safe at the same time? Mine it for terrorist intentions. Okay. The easy answer is you cannot do that. It cannot be done. Because what is going to happen, as we've seen throughout time in, in Memorial, is that we've got rookie incompetence up there, little 25-year-old kids looking at this information. And whenever they come across something like a, native, uh, a naked photograph, naked image, like say, for example, we were talking about uh, in the surveillance rant, that I was worried about these cameras transmitting images of people showering in their second floor window. Well, they're supposed to be looking for the crimes on the corner as an example. The problem is we're getting all of these other privacy invasive things happening and the fact is right now we can't trust the government. They're incompetent. We all agree they're incompetent. So therefore you cannot do that kind of data mining or as I said in the surveillance rant, you cannot have those cameras because you cannot protect the data. So while it's a harsh thing and we want to protect ourselves against these threats, these terrorists, as they say, we're, we are going to have to sacrifice something. And to me, I would rather sacrifice a potential attack than sacrifice going through that ayapapas and a completely intrusive 1984 um, type of government. You know, we'll keep working hard. These guys have come up with some good security. They can keep working on that. When we can finally safeguard the data, then that'll be time that we can actually just look at all of it. All right, I'm gonna move on, thank you. Here's a question from a Canadian friend, seconded by a friend from Germany. Why is it that America appears to be imperialistic, imperialistic at every turn? Great question, by the way. I'm gonna give you the short answer. The short answer is definitely because of money, resources, oil, minerals, always, always has been. The long answer is that corporations used to operate predominantly within our national borders and our armed forces were instrumentalities of these corporations through our beholden elected officials. As the corporations borders have gone beyond the US borders to the truly multinational no borders mentality 
If the U.S. can help them, so be it. If the U.S. cannot, the corporations will do it themselves. Or we'll get the governments that are outside of the U.S. to help them out. A very excellent read detailing our method of nonviolent and more violent takings of other countries' resources is a book written in 2004 by John Perkins called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I absolutely recommend it. Perkins documents his years as an economist for a consultant that did business in countries around the world, but most notably in countries where there could be a large power plant or other infrastructure need to be financed by the World Bank or USA. His role was to show that the addition of, let's say, a power plant in Ecuador or Panama would increase economic growth by a certain percentage. And we'll call it the threshold growth rate, which would in turn raise the living standards for the people there, who would become more productive. And then economic output would increase to pay back the loan made by the World Bank or USA to the country. He asserted that he was required to find the threshold growth rate increase in GDP to justify the loan. He even said that he would come back with lower percentage rates and they would send it back and go, no, we need this. He asserted that payments were given by the corporations that would build the power plant, usually to whichever ruling family was in power. He stated that everyone involved in the financing and construction transaction knew and wink, wink, nod, nodded that the loan would never be repaid which did not matter to that ruling family as they made their money, would not matter to the power plant builder, usually American, because they got their money, would not really matter to the World Bank or USA because they were playing with US taxpayer money from the US federal government and other G8 nations and not using their own money to make the loan. Upon the inevitable default, draconian privatizations of government owned items were required as a part of the forgiveness of the loans and advantageous contracts for exporting of resources would also be a part of the workout package. Anti-competitive measures were imposed on the defaulted country so that they would not compete with the industrialized nations of the G8. The ones that were harmed under this situation were the people in the third world country who now had electricity too expensive to use and it harmed the US taxpayer who just threw a bunch of money, again a part of our commons, at a power plant builder, although I will admit that some 401ks and retirement plans did benefit from increased profits to the power plant building corporations that were in their 401ks. All right, so that's my answer to the why is the US imperialistic? Does anybody in here have any unrelated or related questions they would like to ask? I'll take them on now. Thank, thank God. All right, I wanna thank all of our sponsors. As I've said, some agree, some disagree, but they want this type of discussion to continue. Thank you for your question, studio audience. Uh, one of the sponsors, pianobyangelo.com. Angelo Lembesis, who teaches and plays keyboards all over town, Austin, for cocktail parties, holiday parties, anything. Zitadesign.com, Z-I-T-A design.com, for all your decorative painting needs. She can make anything look like anything. AustinAreaPlumbing.com for all of your plumbing needs. TicoAdventureLodge.com, T-I-C-O, AdventureLodge.com, small hotel in San Marcos, Costa Rica. La, La Vela Latina, a great, I probably said it wrong, La Vela Latina, a great sunset restaurant in San Marcos, Costa Rica, and Amhar Tequila at Santo, S-A-N-T-O, Spirits.com, an extremely smooth tequila. Thanks and God bless and hope to see you next Wednesday at same time, same channel. Thank you.